Hi everyone, good morning. I'm Dana and welcome to Inverter Always. Today we are going to be doing something, it's probably one of the most enjoyable parts about what I do in this industry. After months and months of commercial construction, installation, you know, going through the entire design process with a contractor, and pricing negotiations with the vendor, I finally get to go out and I get to do a startup. Now, I mean, I do startups all the time, don't get me wrong. But I always enjoy getting the invite from the contractor because it solidifies the completion of a project. And I really like to see these projects start to finish. And so when I get invited out to get my hands on and help with programming, it's, it's a really good feeling. So today we're going to be doing something unique in that this particular project we're gonna be looking at has not been powered up yet hasn't been ran through test operation, nothing's been programmed. So we're gonna get to do the entire startup process from start to finish. So I wanted to bring you guys along with me for the ride. If you enjoyed today's video, please make sure to smash that like button, you guys. It really helps out my little channel here is we're still trying to grow. It helps with that YouTube algorithm. So if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe. If you guys wanna see videos like this pop up as notifications, make sure to click that notification bell. All right, you guys, we're about to pull in, so let's go ahead and let's jump right in. Now, the first thing I always do as soon as I get to a job site is walk the install to check for any issues or red flags that I think may cause a problem in the future. And of course, Murphy's Law would give us this nice little beauty first thing in the morning. Found a small leak inside the condenser at the back where two pipes must have rubbed together during shipping. It won't be too bad of a repair, but it will definitely limit how much we can get done today. After checking the outdoor unit, the next thing I'll typically look for are the branch selector boxes. I want to ensure the refrigerant lines are installed properly, maintaining at least two feet of straight pipe before any bends at the branch box. This reduces noise and ensures proper refrigerant flow into and out of the branch boxes. I'll also look for any RefNet Y branches installed to ensure they are installed properly. RefNet Y branches must be installed either completely vertical, as if going up or down the side of a building, or they must be installed completely flat and level, as if sitting on a table. There must also be at least two feet of straight pipe coming into and out of each branch before any bends are made to again ensure proper flow of refrigerant and noise mitigation. Everything looks good here, so we'll move on to the next step. Now, before we power up any of the equipment, I always recommend double checking the wiring connections made at the branch boxes for any loose wires and also make sure you set your dip switches properly. It's IJK, so L is the only one that's empty. Correct. So that means dip switches on the left hand board are all staying off. Middle board are all staying off because we're utilizing all the ports. And on the last box, DS1, switch number four goes on, everything else stays off. So we got ABCD all being used, all the switches are off. We got EF, GH all being used, all the switches are off. We got I and J being used. This is a 10 port box, so all the DS1 switches are off. DS2 switch number four is on, and that's because it's a 10 port box. The board doesn't know that there's two ports that don't exist. And then this is going to be a wire nut on D. So port D, we're gonna need to fix that. As you guys should know, using wire nuts for communication is never a good idea. So the guy soldered this splice together properly so we wouldn't have issues later. Basically, when setting dip switches, always refer to the chart that's on the inside of the branch box panel and it will guide you through which switches to turn on. Most of the time we only set DS1 switches on for the ports we are not using. And because each board is set up for four ports each, when installing a six or 10 port box, you need to check that DS2 switch four is on, which disables those two ports internally on the board since they don't physically exist. Now it's time to power up the indoor units and branch boxes, but quickly walk the job and check each stat for a display to ensure everything is powered. Failure to do this will increase the time it takes for startup, so make sure everything gets power. 
you can see this one does not have a display, which means the Ender unit doesn't have power or they can get wired up properly. Okay, that one's good. It's got a display. You guys get the idea, do this for all the Ender units. When checking power on your branch boxes, you'll see a green blinking LED, which indicates each board has power. It's hard to see on camera, but it's there. Oh, you already got an air, you got a U1, reverse phase. When powering up outdoor equipment, check for any U1 air codes. There's a 30% chance one or more of the outdoor units got wired up in a reversed phase. Not to worry though, this is an easy fix. Just flip two legs and you're good to go. I also want to point out that my refresh rate on my camera did not match the LED screen of the outdoor unit. So while it's going to be hard to see what the display actually says, I'll just walk you through and explain it along the way. There we go. Both modules had reverse phase. So the blinky circles means that it's initializing. And these circles can blink up to 15 minutes. I'll jump in here. As you guys can see, the camera picks up each frame of the LED display of the board at a different interval. So while to the human eye, it appears as though there are three small circles blinking together on camera, it looks like a garbled mess and I apologize. I can assure you though, that when you power on the equipment, there will be three small circles blinking together. And when they go solid, that's indicating that it's almost done initializing. That's usually when it's going out and it's giving all the Ender units their auto address. Mm -hmm. And then once it's solid for a few minutes, then it should go blank. And blank screen is your home screen. That's the good, that's a good screen. Okay. If there's any errors along the way, it'll give you an error code. Um, if they're solid for more than 30 minutes, then there's an error somewhere inside the building. So you gotta go turn on all the stats and see what the error code is. Like if you have an unplugged expansion valve, that's okay. a good example, it happens commonly. So we'll go ahead and we'll just monitor this. All of your refrigerant charge adders. Jug one, jug two, jug three. Yep. I like that. We're blank. So blank screen is a good screen. So the first thing, as soon as it goes blank, the first thing you gotta do is you gotta verify communication between the indoor and outdoor equipment. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna do something called counting our indoor units. So we go mode one, it's a monitor mode. And it's super hard to see it, but it's blinking one zero zero. Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna go set to 10. I went too far. Okay, well 11 is branch boxes. So we'll go ahead and we'll check our branch box ports. So it says we've got 28, 28 ports being used. So we're gonna go back. Now this time we're gonna go to 10. So you can see we're blinking 1.10. Now we're gonna hit return. 28 indoors. So we had a 12 port box. On the 12, only 11 is being used. We were using 11, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then on the 10 port box. All 10 were being used. All 10 were being used. Okay, that's 21. And then on that other 10 port box, we had eight being used. That's 29, so we're missing one. So what we're gonna do here is we're gonna go to something called forced fan. So we go to mode two, service mode, by holding the mode button. And we're gonna go one, two, three, four, five. Return to go in. Then it's off, we're gonna turn it on. Return, return. So now it goes back to two, zero, zero. It's super hard to see, but it does say two, zero, zero. Blinking. So now we're gonna go check the fans. Let's go see which indoor unit fan isn't running. So let's recap that real quick. We went in and we determined the outdoor unit only addressed 28 out of our 29 indoor units, which means one of the indoor units is not communicating. This is very common and is usually either a unit that did not get powered up 
or a unit that is not wired correctly. By using forced fan from the outdoor unit, the outdoor will tell all of the indoors to operate their fans, which allows us to very easily walk the job and look to see which indoor unit is not operating the fan. All right, so we're just gonna see which indoor unit fan isn't running. This is gonna be like, so that one's open. That one's open. You can see that one's open. That one's open. That one's open. That one's open, you found it? Oh, this one's not open. It's this one, Justin. See how that one's not open? From the outdoor unit, I commanded all the indoors on. So this is the one that's not communicating. All right, so what we gotta do here, now that we've found the unit that was missing, is we have to hold the return button when we reapply power for 20 seconds and that's going to do a master reset to reset the addressing, the auto addressing. So that'll tell it we're adding an additional indoor unit, a 29th indoor unit. And then we just wait for this process to repeat. Boom, so you can see it's already solid. I know it doesn't look solid, but it is. Blank. So now let's check. One, two. Wow, it's so hard to see when you're holding the camera. 10. We have 29. Now you can see 29. That's how many indoors we got installed. So now we'll go to 11. 29 ports. Very good. Cool. So now that we've established all the indoor equipment is communicating with the outdoor unit, we need to go around and address each unit and set the field settings on all the thermostats. I'll put a card in the corner now. We've talked about field settings in several videos in the past, but check out my nav controller playlist as it will have a full tutorial on how to use this controller. There we go, 207. You can see it's set at the top. Our back up. Airnet is 27 according to our as builts. Same thing as before, you can hold it or you can press it a bunch of times. 27, great. Okay, go back, go do field settings. Now, the wall mount units do not have very many field settings. We're going to tell it to use the thermostat for control and push that number to a central controller. 502, great. And then mode 22. 2-02 is a one degree dead band, so we don't need to change it. That means we are all done with field settings. And then once it's sent all that information back to the indoor unit, we'll go back to the main screen, or the main screen. Bam, done. Bam, so this is, what did I say, two or three? Two or three. While I'm doing this, I want to remind everyone how important it is to have a copy of your as built handy. On every single job I commission, I always prepare a sheet that has each unit number, address, and the field settings list for each indoor unit that I'm going to be programming, so that way I don't miss any units and also don't duplicate any addresses. It also makes doing all of this go way faster than if you're trying to remember everything or make it up on the spot. change much on this one. 22, 202 will already be set. Bam, done. On to the next one. It's up to you whether you do this now or after you run the system test, but because the outdoor unit had a leak this morning, we were unable to operate the equipment, so we focused on getting all the controls work completed before we ran anything. You'll want to go around and get all of your thermostats programmed and addressed all at once so that you're not going back and forth wasting time later. All right, so now what we're going to do is we're going to air net the outdoor system. That's going to be 2.13. Still hard to see, but it is 2.13. 
And we're just gonna air net this outdoors one. Return, return, back to 2.00 and then escape. Okay, so that's air net addressed. Now, even though it's not going to be part of this video today, I wanted to give you guys a quick peek at programming the Daikin ITM central controller. We can program the ITM through a USB, but before you do anything, make sure you set the battery backup switch to on. Next, you want to update the ITM software version to the latest version, which right now is 2.08. To load the software, insert your USB drive, hold the monitor button down, and while holding the button down, press the reset button with a pen or paper clip. Continue holding the monitor button down until you see the screen say booting from USB, which at that time you may let go of the monitor button. It will take a few minutes to load, but will prompt you to calibrate the screen. Simply press in the indicated circles. The existing version will display on screen and also the version you are updating to. Go ahead and click on OK. It will take a few minutes for the version to install, but once complete, you will see a new window display on screen. At this time, you may click on close, remove your USB drive, and the ITM will reboot. We are also going to upload the pre-programmed job site information into the ITM, which I programmed from my laptop earlier in the day. Follow the same steps as before to upload the program to the ITM. Insert the USB, hold the monitor button down. While holding the button down, press the reset button and continue holding the monitor button until you see the text on screen, which says booting from USB. The screen calibration will load, press in the indicated circles, and once complete, you will see the existing version and new version match. This is okay. Press okay to continue uploading the program for the job site. Once complete, a new window will populate press close and remove your USB, the ITM will reboot and as long as everything was programmed properly on the ITM and on all the stats, you should see all of your equipment populate. All right, so you can see we got, we're golden. So we got no blue triangles. It means we've got communication with everything. All right, that's great news. Awesome. So we're all done here. Oh, and I've seen Refnet insulation kits be used for a lot of things over the years, but this has to be the first time I've seen them used as doorstops. I thought this was hilarious. Now, unfortunately, you guys, today we did not get to operate the equipment. That leak that we found at the outdoor condenser right when we got there put a little bit of a dent in our plans. We were able to use our time wisely, though, since we were already there. We got all the control work done, all the programming. We went through, we did the dip switches on the branch box. We got the group and air net addressing done. We've got all our field settings completed at all the thermostats. We fixed a couple of wiring issues as well along the way. And we got the central controller totally programmed and ready for the end user. So part one, kind of complete, done. Now the contractor is going to go through, fix the leak. They're gonna repull a vacuum, add new refrigerant back into the system. And later this week, we'll go back for part two, run the system through test operation. We'll throw service checker on. We'll do port checks and then we'll do a final performance test so you guys will see a little bit of service checker for the first time which will be exciting you guys thank you so much for watching today i hope you enjoyed the video part one of part two for a commercial vrv startup if you enjoyed today's video click the like button below it really helps out my channel and if you guys haven't already please consider subscribing thank you so much for watching inverter always i hope you guys have an awesome day